All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this thing. This has been a really good time for us, um, especially Alexander. Thank you so much for bringing us. Anna, Brittany, Daniel, Greg, all of, um, the graphics department, everybody, especially the museum. Yeah, and so we've just prepared a series of paragraphs. That feels really loud. Um, some of them are our own words, and some of them are appropriated. And, we, and uh, we hope to give you a sense of the way we've been thinking about and what we've been reading about. Um, in relationship to playing with these drones. Um, the footage behind us is a collection of um, shots we've taken in uh, Balboa Park uh, and Portland, Oregon. And um, it's just going to play as we talk. Um, so please bear with us as we like deliver this really meandering uh, talk. OK. All right. So we are coming to this from a position of total averageness, right? Um, we don't have a propensity for figuring out technological problems, nor are we interested in technological innovation. But when Alexander asked us if we wanted to participate in the series, um, we sort of on a whim proposed a drone, but it, it somehow seemed appropriate since so much drone technology was developed in San Diego. Um, so Marshall McLuhan wrote about media quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> he wrote, media, by altering the environment, invoke in us unique ratios of sense perception. The extension of any one sense alters the way we think and act, the way we perceive the world. And when these ratios change, men change. So um, with, our kind of, with our research into drones, we wanted to really explore those ratios and figure out how to characterize the way that drone technology might be changing us or might have already changed us. Um, and so <clears throat> this seems like, as Ryan was saying, like a really proper time to do this because there's been this incredible um, surge in press about drones um, overseas and domestically um, in the recent months. What makes a drone and how does it function? Who is flying drones and why? why how is this technology not new? How are we already a drone culture? How is ours a drone economy, a drone government? Is there a politics of verticality? What is the essential logic of drone technology? And what existing logics does it extend? How is the proliferation of drones in warfare, surveillance, law enforcement, and entertainment shifting our collective worldview? And how does our current worldview dictate our use of drones? Um, what does aerial perspective offer? Uh, what does it deny? Uh, what are the long-term co long cognitive effects of seeing topography flattened? And in what ways is drone surveillance affecting the aesthetics of faculty, of realism, factuality. of factuality, of realism in the way we recognize truth? Um, what do drones recognize as truth? What about abstraction? What is the difference between looking and seeing? And what is the difference between knowledge and information, algorithm, heuristic? Um, analysis and interpretation, land and landscape, and how do we determine our own scale? And for that matter, who gets to hold the ruler? So that was sort of the series of questions that we started thinking about this with. Um, drone is more than a noun. It is the verb of the telepresent moment. It is locatable, bird's eye seeable, searchable, and autonomously command controlled. Loitering, humming and buzzing algorithms swarming in form. We are already droning, moving in sequence, caught between intelligence and information, necessity and novelty, velocity and inertia, aesthetic understanding, and applied knowledge. Um, so for us, this project is really an ongoing project. It's a direction. Um, one, we began, one way we begin our research is through reading. That's a very comfortable mode for us. And the other is through what anthropologi anthropologists call participant observation. Um, so uh, observing through practicing. Um, the thought being, if we are observing drones, we have to drone with them. In some ways, building our own drone was harder than we imagined, mostly because electronics, engineering, programming, and hobbying are not our indigenous intelligence. Luckily, we have a resident engineer and a programmer on hand to help when we got stuck. But in many ways, it was much, much easier and cheaper than we expected it would be. And after teaching ourselves how to fly an RC uh, model, model plane, we decided to build a copter. 
um, with parts from Hong Kong and a circuit board that was developed here in San Diego. And pretty much we just started flying. This was less than two months ago, maybe two months ago at the most. Artists today are often expected to be journalists, investigative representatives of privileged information. Think of Taryn Simon and her work with Unfamiliar Places, or Trevor Paglian with Government Secrecy, Waleed Rad with Lambadon, Helen Reed with Twin Peaks Bands. That responsibility <clears throat> of journalism, that lineage, is really heavy for us to bear. Um, we're not journalists, and we never have been, but we are really preoccupied, again, with this idea of fact and what it looks like and how um, the look of a fact has changed over time. Um, we're interested in, in trying to understand how we kind of deconstruct the codes of of realism because they become really naturalized in our everyday experience. Um, and so we did a, a quite a bit of research about factuality and realism in visual images and how that is interpreted by viewers and how drone imagery, um, all of this footage that's being collected not only by amateur um, drone flyers but also by the military is affecting our ideas about aesthetics. The aesthetics of factuality encompass many devices that have evolved over time. Through the development of linear perspective and its contestations, the emergence of photographic technology, cinema, and real-time broadcasts. But across genres, certain formal structures have, uh, have sort of crossed over and are used to communicate the sense of definiteness. And one of those structures is perspective, um, being both a compositional method for organizing structure within a composition so that it looks like reality, but also as a metaphor for um, a particular viewpoint, like a shared way of perceiving the world um, and believing. So we've been reading a lot about um, the importance of metaphor in the way that we think as well, and a very foundational text by Mark uh, Johnson and George Lakoff called Metaphors We Live By, which was published, I think, in the early 80s talks a lot about how there are these underlying orientational metaphors that organize our cognition and the way that we communicate and think. And um, among other comparisons that they outline, some of them that, that they talk about are that consciousness, we think about consciousness as up and unconsciousness is down. Um, having control or force is, is up and being subject to control or force is down. Virtue is up, depravity down. Um, so they outline that control, consciousness, virtue, truth are beyond any kind of stylization really powerfully and sort of gutturally for us um, oriented up. Thus this kind of aerial perspective like we're seeing here with its wide glare and its like kind of unmoored um, all-encompassing view seems to represent to our vein possibly like kind of maximum in objectivity, right? We're like gaining perspective. Beyond perspectives, the elements of time translates in the visual field to communicate greater or lesser sense of realness as well, right? Um, and so you can think about like the way the Occupy movement was covered as uh, um, sort of like tipping us off to this, right? Like so it being completely essentially covered through live stream TV or internet. Um, and so we live in a, a world that is dramatically different from the world of Renaissance perspective, scientific rationalism and even modern world views through the end of the 20th century. Uh, time has become a crucial element. Um, authenticity is immediate transmission. Where the instant of making an image is collapsed with the moment, uh, the moment of viewing, right? Um, sorry. Uh, the visual styles that code the live broadcast have become our signposts of, ver uh, of veracity. Um, their abstraction and their rawness work against the suspicion of the photographic medium and its easy alterability. And the contemporary establishment of, of, YouTube, of the YouTube look validates this, this like lack of high definition, this lack of crispness um, um, that I think we traditionally like relate to like, uh, you know, major news programs and stuff like that. Um, so fragmentary, pixelated, abstract, glitchy, um, they're familiar sensor-painted Monets by machines, right? So drone tech, especially in the military, brings both um, the structures of perspective um, and, and 
and transmission to the maximum intensity, um, capturing footage um, that epitomizes contemporary authenticity. Within a, a consideration of perspective, not only do they provide a top-down view, but the view embodies multiple perspectives stitched together into one immersive field complete with geographic coordinates. So what we've sort of started calling drone realism um, is an extension of satellite vision um, and the rise of amateur droning, which is huge. Like there's more, there's thought to be more amateur drones like the ones we're flying out here than there are military drones in the US at this point. Um, make it uh, appear that, that the, 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 the like cyber and satellite visualities are sort of re-articulated and then put into the hands of citizens rather than military officials as they have been or scientists. So in other words, these interfaces transform satellite images, these aerial, really distant views, into tactile fields of public cultural engagement. This is in itself significant since for decades they have been under the exclusive purview of the state, scientists, and corporations. Um, and that's a quote from a, a visual theorist, Lisa Parks. But maybe that's just what we want to hear. Um, we're critical of that perspective, too, because democratized drone tech not only extends the logic of ownership and domination through vision and movement, its realism also conceals realer realities, uh, that positivism is undying, that the state is still in control, and that there is nothing post about colonialism. Um, part of our initial interest in drones was its applications for surveillance, so protest, um, the grassroots mapping, um, but as we worked with this technology a little bit and read about what's being developed and used by secur the security industry, um, we're a little critical of our own impulse for, for drone activism. Um, so we're implicated as well, right? Um, everything is being mapped, collected, transmitted, stored, analyzed, and perhaps real resistance is the, uh, the urge to resist documentation. <laughs> as I look into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tyler Wall and Torin Mon Monahan wrote in a really amazing paper, Surveillance uh, and Violence from Afar, the Politics of Drones and Liminal, I can't read my own handwriting, Liminal Security Scapes. Um, they talk about the structures of time and verticality, um, and they say, in contested air arenas of organized warfare and international immigration, Drones extend the control logics that have long characterized modern warfare. Paul Virilio argues that Western society is defined by its quest for faster and more mobile technologies, from transportation vehicles such as the car and the airplane to information technology such as television and computer. For Virilio, the Western obsession with technological development is first and foremost linked to warfare and militaries, secondarily to the political desire to control people and their movements. By identifying those who control the various technologies of speed in a given society, we can also identify the victors. Unequal mobility and speed correspond with what E.L. Weissman has called the politics of verticality, which he has written about in the context of the Israeli occupation of Gaza. For it is not technological speed alone that assures control over the enemy, but also the ability to achieve higher elevations in order to gain observational advantage. The extraterrestrial satellite epitomizes the desire for dominance through verticality, but the hill, the rooftop, and the airplane are also technologies of verticality frequently deployed in practices of control. So it became really interesting for us that drones also were this kind of unique fusion of all of um, the developments in information technology kind of paired with all of the developments in speed technology and mobility technologies that Virilio is talking about. So ankle deep in our reading about drones, we began watching the re-release of Cosmos, um, which was a TV series by, with Carl Sagan. Um, at the beginning, the co-creator, Ann Durian, um, gives a sincere forward, speaking about the time in which Cosmos was first conceived and created. Um, and she describes it as, so the United States and the Soviet Union held the whole planet in perpet perpetual hostage crisis called the Cold War. The wealth and scientific ingenuity of our civilization was being squandered on a runaway arms race and employed more than half of the world's scientists infested the earth with 50,000 nuclear weapons. 
So nothing and everything has changed. We're still living under the sentence of that proliferation and still squandering the wealth and ingenuity of our civilization in the name of national security. And perhaps the ever-present possibility, nearly instant nuclear annihilation, is the underlying cause um, for our, our constant paranoia. And we have, in the words of Hannah Arendt, already destroyed the future. Vigilance, at all costs, is necessitated. Drama. <laughs> Wendy Brown, um, a really amazing political theorist and feminist out of Berkeley, in a lecture she gave recently called Wall State's Waning Sovereignty, uh, sketched this paradoxical relation between this preoccupation with security and defense that so many uh, countries have and also the waning relevance of national borders and diminishing grip, grip of sovereignty. So they're sort of like overcompensating maybe. Globalization and technological speed have made borders appear as antiquated formalizations. And yet, at the same time, there's this massive blooming of construction of walls. So nine-foot steel borders in between countries, internet firewalls, all different kinds of walls. It's as if we're frantically attempting to separate and secure country from country, space from space, first world from third. And we really see these paradoxes everywhere. We value one thing, but then we express culturally another. Um, similarly, at odds, the United States security agencies have widened their net in recent years, so they sanction amazingly, uh, at times, it seems, illegal searches on American citizens, but at the same time, these notions of individual freedom are at an increasingly uh, high saturation in political discourse and social discourse. Um, individual liberty is really paramount, but it's also being rendered a scarcity by the same agencies that are seeking to protect it. Uh, and they do it with the same technology that we use to perceive our own sort of surrogate liberty. So um, since the attacks on September 11th, um, the United States has spent uh, about 7.6 trillion on defense and homeland security. Um, the National Security Administration has a budget of around $6 billion a year and the ever maturing capability to monitor the movements, transactions, and communications of 10 billion people, American citizens included. Um, all, and this is all in real time while it's happening. Global Hawk drones provide long dwell presence above ground, traveling in a network of five orbits that cover the world to record and collect information, right? So they just spin the world taking photos. Um, uh, so, and at this point, the NSA is intercepting and archiving so much information, so like email, uh, cell phones, text messages, whatever, anything digital, um, from, from enemies at home and abroad um, in order to store it all. They have begun the, the construction of a $2 billion uh, monumental uh, data storage center in, a, in remote Utah. Um, and so it'll be a 1 million f square foot uh, complex capable of holding a yottabyte of data, which is equal to, a to about a septillion uh, pages of text. Right, so that's like a sort of unfathomable amounts. But, but statistics, right, they're meaningless. Um, and money certainly becomes a kind of tyrannical abstraction for us. Numbers like that um, don't make me really feel anything because they just don't feel real. Um, but if we think about our daily use of the internet, there's a reality that really implicates us and sort of makes drone technology real, at least for me. Sorry. Um, total information awareness is not just a post-9-11 government agency, but it's the democratic cause of the internet. Look at the features of drone technology, unmanned aerial vehicles, GPS or geographic information systems, surveillance, surveillance. So there are networks of collected information over land and in the sky. And then if you consider the consumer side of tech, so mapping programs, location aware pocket devices, like everything that's on your iPhone. Um, public source media databases and the apps and the algorithms that we use to navigate and deal with that technology. It's all the same as the things that are in the drones that we're flying out here tonight. It's all the same sensors and gyros. <clears throat> so we're just really realizing how we're actually, we are already in a very much drone culture. Like we're coloring inside those lines. Um, and making the shapes that they're making in a certain way. And we're looking at things in really flattened glimpses. These are imaginative descriptions. Um, it's tempting to extrapolate from theoretical technological possibilities. Um, D David Graeber um, 
he gave a lecture at SVA in uh, January this year, um, and he talked about this disparity between um, the technology that our generation was expecting to have at this point, right? Um, so the imagined, the imagined technology and things like science fiction in the 20th century. Um, so he lists things like anti-gravity boots, flying cars, time machines, uh, teleportation devices, things like that, right? And the, uh, well, and the te technologies that we actually do have um, at our disposal. He argues um, they're sort of like simulations of that, right? Um, so he, he, or he argues that the postmodern condition could really be characterized by a series of reflections on a profound and unrecognized disappointing trauma of technological disappointment. Um, Which so, is a pretty funny idea. Right? But, um, and one that is telling. compounded by the shame we feel for having these expectations the, to begin with, right? Like, I feel, you know, I shouldn't have expected that we had, would have flying cars by now. Um, so Graver's profound lack of awe for the smart technology of today is, is kind of refreshing because we, we hear so much about new technology, how it's smaller, faster, more connected, um, all that kind of stuff. And it's, and it's not as though he claims we haven't benefited from technological development. Um, but we don't have the poetic technologies of science fiction and, and of dreams. Um, so we, instead, we have this overwhelmingly bureaucratic technology. Right? So he writes that the 20th century produced a very clear sense of what the future was to be. But we now seem unable to imagine any sort of redemptive future. How did this happen? Graeber attributes this partially to a lack of poetic technologies and partially to the ter terminal uh, perturbations of capitalism, which is increasingly unable to envision any future other than itself. So <clears throat> the increasing simulated nature of our contemporary experience is partly his evidence. So he's really arguing that all of those things that were dreams in the 20th century, we see now, but we see them as special effects in movies. Um, we don't have them as daily usable realities. Um, so in the ethos of simulation, drone technology is, is kind of new in that it's, um, it's making happen this kind of total displacement of the body. It's replacing it rather than extending it in a kind of typical cyborg fashion. And so we distinguish drone technology by that detachment. It is about distance from us. It's autonomous. It's unmanned. Um, it's not like a remote controlled device, which is sort of still a projection of the body. <clears throat> Okay, so still, drones are, are not artificially intelligent. Um, flying, talking, sympathizing, or, or humorous robots of the, our 20th century dreams. Um, so we don't expect social intelligence in the manners of things like, I don't, what was that guy's name? Data or C3PO or things like that. Um, but if they are going to be uh, autonomous entities, then we do ache for something that's like slightly more nuanced than just like on off, connected, disconnected, armed, disarmed. So we're caught somewhere between this imagination and total cynicism, hope and uh, fear, fascination um, by the prospects that this could be the start of a, more po of a more poetic technology. But what would that look like? And uh, what would it take us? And where would it take us? I mean, we're wary, and, and, and partly for fear of the machine, but also because this is a good chance we'll get, um, we'll be like pretty underwhelmed by the technological manifestations, like normal. Um, so we're going to close with some writing, a, a little brief little writing um, about what he's calling drone kitsch by a really interesting writer called the, the Metaphorian Researcher. One and the same bloated polter zeitgeist coughs up simultaneously two such things as a domestic drone program and downloadable secret shopper app, or a loitering UAV and a lingering UFO fetish. All four vie for our attention and are ostensibly 
Rothsteinian drone ethnographies with contextual contours of parafact, parafiction, paramilitary, and the paranormal. One wonders if the connection engines that could, won't, instead just sputter to a halt, paralyzed by prefixations. A drone domesticated for surveillance along border lines and an app tailored for reconnaissance along bottom lines. What perspective on the networked cosmos is awry enough to enable us to situate them in relation to each other? Alas, anamorphoses, too, are hard-pressed to find work in a network economy. Constellations of coherency amidst continuous parallel attention might well mirror the actions of radicalized zombie sats. Truly, this scenario also hints at a worldview beset by non-lineation, vertical disintegrations. In any case, where there can be an avant-garde meandering now for half a century, a slow motion momentum, an antagonism towards ambushes, the delayed arrival of a possible future still looms. And I think we're going to close with that. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah. So, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. How small can these things get and still be, you know, able to do the basic functions of that piece that they have there? So, we're talking about the size of the So, bumblebees. Yeah. They're. Yeah. So they're they're quite small ones. I don't think it's quite that small, but it's you know under an inch. Um, there's a hummingbird one, yeah, that is developed. Um, there's also, they're also developing one based on the flight pattern of butterflies, so it's going to fly in a completely different manner. Um, but it's the size of a butterfly, and it looks exactly like a butterfly. Um, I think the hummingbird ones are probably the smallest ones that are, like, really in use that we've come across. Um, and there is sort of, they do, they swarm, which is a really other interesting thing that we came across, so drone swarms. Right, it sounds like really, like, I don't know, like total dysutopian nightmare. Um, but, so essentially, but it's actually really cool, like a, a swarm of them will come in and map an entire territory, just each picking little sections to photograph and stuff like that. And then that data will all be sent back and sort of uh, patched together to sort of like, so you could like, you know, old ruins, you could send them into a ruins and they could like get a really perfect rendering computer rendering of the topography of that ruin. They also would be really useful in warfare because if you... <laughs> yeah. If you hit a swarm, it would just break apart and each of the little pieces could fly apart and then reassemble, theoretically. So it's kind of like a nanotechnology, but not nanotechnology. It's just like that same idea of a group of things creating something that has a whole... Mm -hmm. I think so. Again, we're not totally experts, but... But most of the things like the Predator drones, right, they're actually built in pods as well. So there's like three or five. So they come with three or five and they sort of fly together, right? And they sort of are somewhat synced up. So, I mean, I think, which is something we didn't really touch on, but I think is, is really interesting in all the drone technology is this idea of the swarm, right? So if there's no more questions, we plan to have just one final flight um, in the sculpture garden. It looks very lovely out there. Um, so if anyone wants to join us out there, we can sort of move that way. Thank you.